Well, hello and welcome to the Jay Sterling Hughes Show, where we share the secrets and tactics of how we are building a rapidly growing family law practice. You know, over the past nine years, we have grown from zero attorneys to 25 and doing over $15 million in revenue. And my purpose here is to document what's working and what's not working in our practice with hopes that you can take that and you can recontextualize that in your practice. And today's show, I'm excited to share with you uh, John Morris. John is on our board at Sterling Law and he has added tremendous value to how we look at our business, how we benchmark our firm, and just really how we break down where we need to be in the major segments of our finances. So I've asked John if he could come on today and just share with you his insights and how he has built his business engine BI to serve professional practices. And so John, um, welcome, and we'd love to hear a little about your story and what brought you here. Yeah, Jeff, uh, thanks for having me on here. I've actually been, I'll say, in the professional service space for my entire adult career, but more in the marketing side as opposed to, let's just say, the legal side. I founded a marketing agency in 2004 called Rise Interactive. I grew up from just me to one of the largest independent marketing agencies or digital marketing agencies globally. I sold it in 2020. And one of the secrets to my success was really just how I focused on spending my time and my money. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, that's all we have. It's all you have. It's all I have is whoever spends their time and money more effectively and more intelligently is going to scale and grow. Right. And I use data driven insights and specifically benchmarkings and understanding exactly how much I need to spend in every specific area to help me achieve this goal. And so what Engine BI has done is we've built a software platform that's specifically designed to help professional service companies achieve those metrics. So that's a little bit of my background and you know what I am doing today. Yeah, full disclosure to everyone. We are a customer of John's at our sister company, Rocket Clicks. And John, you didn't prompt me for this, but let me just share yeah. with everyone that's listening. We have got tremendous value from what you've delivered to us from a vendor relationship. I know you have completely, and I'm not overstating this at all, you've transformed how we look at our businesses from a big picture financial and business intelligence standpoint. So thank you for that. And what we've taken from you has really helped us grow over the past year and into this year. So just to put an authentic plug out there for what you've delivered, not only obviously on our board um, and what you do for us there has been awesome as well. So let me just kind of back up a little bit and can you just start from a big picture how you look at a professional service business from the metrics and the financials and then drilling into there. Absolutely. So if you think about the one thing that all professional service companies have in common, whether you're a law firm, a marketing agency, an architect, an engineer, a management consultant, is we sell time. Mm -hmm. And when you are selling time, it really doesn't matter what, what you're selling there's certain very clear benchmarks of what you need to do in terms of achieving success. The first thing that I like to always explain to people is that there are two versions of yourself. Almost every single person who has started their own company has started it because they want to offer the services that they are great at. So if you are a family lawyer, you want to do family law. Yeah. But the second you started your own business, now you're an entrepreneur. And I always tell people that you have to have some self-reflection. Do you want to be an entrepreneur that builds a large, great business that happens to provide family law? Or do you want to be a family lawyer that has to do a little bit of the business side just to make sure that you keep the family law going? And there's no right or wrong answer. It's a self-reflection. I tend to focus on the people who are looking to build a larger organization and they want to scale their practice. Yeah. And so the first thing is some key benchmarks. I ideally want your year over year revenue growth to be 20% or greater. That's your top I line want, when, you, when you refer to revenue. That's your top line revenue. Yeah. And by the way, if there's any pass through, so like in the world of marketing, like if you're spending media on behalf of your clients, like that media doesn't count. So if you spend yeah. $10 million on Google, that $10 million doesn't count. So if there's anything in family law that just gets passed on or any other 
you know, like consumer type law that's like not your money. You don't get to count that. Yeah. Um, so it's your actual fees that you collect. I want you to grow at 20% year over year. Now, the next thing, and this generally requires a little bit of education, is there's something called gross margin. What I find amazing it is it's the most important number to know. And the vast majority of professional service companies do not know what this is. Yeah. Your, why is it so important to know? Because it's how efficiently or how profitably are you servicing your customers? So if you think about like, if you sell a widget, like, you know, you sell a pencil, you mm -hmm. sell a pencil for a dollar and it costs you 10 cents to make, you have a 90% margin. Okay. But because we sell time, it's not always easy to measure. Right. And so what you want to do is you want to take all of your cost. I call it cost of service. Every single thing that relates to doing client work. So your lawyers, if there's any travel and entertainment, if there's any client gifts, if you have to license any technology to work on the client, all of that goes into your cost of service. And so when you take your revenue minus your cost of service, you get your gross profit. So John, let me just kind of double tap on this here with respect to the cost yeah. of service. So I'm a law firm with three other lawyers and three other staff members supporting our team. Are those staff members included? Like paralegal Are they working on the clients or are they working on something else? I would say in most firms they're working on clients and maybe there's a small percentage of them that are doing office bookkeeping sort of thing. So, so, so the office bookkeeping time would be moved to another area. Like if they are like paralegals or they're sitting there doing any support work for a client whatsoever, that all goes into the cost of service bucket. Mm -hmm. So what you've guided us on here, just to give an example out here, we've got 24 practicing attorneys and roughly 12 to 13 support staff. And we also have their, the rent for the offices that they occupy. And then their tools, their like Salesforce is one of ours, our CRM tool yep. that we use. That is all included in cost of service because we need those things to serve our clients. Is that how you're? That's that how is you're absolutely got correct. It. Got it. So okay. now I'm going to tell you the magic numbers. If your gross margin is above 50%, you will be most likely very profitable and you will have money that you can invest back into the business. If your gross margin is between 40% and 50%, you will have to choose between being profitable or investing back in your business. And if your gross margin is lower than 40%, you will most likely be losing money. So with respect to a, the owner of the law firm, yeah, they're, they're most likely taking money out of the firm in the form of either a distribution or maybe a, a salary, depending on how they want to do things. How do you figure that cost there? So, okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the leadership team of a professional service okay. company. You have a CEO and there should be four leaders. Now that could be broken up into a few different people, but one is a head of sales and marketing. This person is responsible for going out and getting new business, bringing in new logos or new individuals into your company. The second one is a head of operations and finance. This person does all the back of office work. They close the books, they put your budget together, they do the, your HR. So if you're hiring more legal people, lawyers or paralegals, do all of your corporate IT to make sure that your systems are working, you know, all the back of office stuff. Okay. The third one, is you need someone who's responsible for doing all the client work. So someone who's in charge of all the lawyers to make sure that the output that they're doing is getting delivered the way you want. And then the last one is a head of research and development. Now, when I think of research and development, I'm not talking about like innovation with a capital I, but I'm talking about innovation with a lowercase I. There's something called service design. What is the experience like for your customers? What are there other services you want to expand into? How can you make your service offering better? So that's what the leadership team looks like. If you're that, a very small family lawyer, you might be sitting in all of those seats by yourself. Yeah. Okay. So Been there done that. Yeah. Yep. And so, you know, like when I started rise, my previous agency, and when I started engine BI and I have another company called fiscal advocate, 
which offers fractional CFO services mm -hmm. for professional service companies. I drew out my org structure and I had my name in every single seat. And my job was over several years was to remove me and get someone else to sit in those seats. And so that's the first thing. So if you are the owner of your law firm and you happen to also be the lawyer doing all the work, you might want to split your fees or your salary and say like, mm -hmm. this much is going towards delivering customer work. This much is going towards running the business. Yeah. If you are truly out of the day to day, then you would be a hundred percent in the next section, which I haven't described yet, which is SGNA, which is all of your expenses that are not related to client work. So let me, let's just stay here for a second because you're really okay. giving great stuff. So in the gross margin number, you're like for most of my colleagues, they are not entirely out of the practice. They're running a firm and they're splitting their time between running the firm and also serving the clients, managing the lawyers who are taking care of the clients. Yep. So like, majority of them are going to really sit in all four of these seats, especially in the early years as they're starting and building up their practice. So just for a easy math, let's say they're a quarter in each of these. Yeah. Given that one of them deals with clients. It'd be a quarter of their time would be taking care of clients that would go in gross margin. Yeah. Right? So generally okay. what I do is let me explain the SGNA section real quickly. Okay. So in the SGNA, which stands for selling general and administrative expenses, you're going to have a few major categories. So you're going to have sales and marketing as a category. You're going to have executive as a category. You're going to have operations and finance as a category, and you're going to have research and development as a category. I'm suggesting that if you're the CEO of the company, that you don't break your time up into each one of those buckets. You just put yourself in the executive bucket. Okay. And so let's just say you're making, I don't know, for simple math, a hundred thousand a year. You'd put 50,000 in cost of service, 50,000 in the executive team. You're not going to break it up and say this much goes to sales and marketing. This much goes there. It just gets the math isn't worth the exercise. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. So I would also tell you is oftentimes the numbers will get skewed a little bit when you're smaller because you know, if you decide to put yourself all in the executive team, you might have this amazing gross margin, but it's because you're doing all the work, you know, or if you're doing all the work, your SGNA might look really low. So it's as you scale, the numbers will start to fill in nicely and, and make more sense. Mm -hmm. I see. So I, I distracted you a little bit as you were talking about the magic numbers and you were saying that if you're at 50% or more gross margin, you're very yep. profitable, 40 to 50. You've got to really choose between profitability and reinvesting in your business and under 40, you're probably losing money. Can you dig into that a little bit more, especially in that middle section, which is where I think a lot of my colleagues would be in that 40 to 50% range? Yes. So now what you have to do is look at your SGNA. Okay. Generally, I recommend that you get 30% of your revenue for your SGNA. 8% specifically for sales and marketing. So that is how much you get to spend to acquire new customers. 15% mm -hmm. for operations and finance, your back of office. Okay. 7% for your executive team. And what I can tell you is the vast majority of companies that I've met in the professional service firms spend zero on research and development. Mm -hmm. I recommend spending up to 5% of your money on research and development. And what I want you to be thinking about is there are tens of thousands of family lawyers or personal injury lawyers, or, you know, what, whatever type of law you practice, you have a lot of competition. And so what I want you to really spend time thinking about is how do you differentiate yourself? And if you don't invest in that differentiation, it goes back to time and money mm -hmm. is you're not going to be differentiated. And so, you know, I'm talking about spending 30 to 35% of your money on your SGNA. Oftentimes people are spending more than that, but they haven't organized their finances to even know how they're spending their money. Yeah. And so you can see if you get 30% and you have a 50% gross margin, you get to put 20% of your revenue into your pocket. Now, if you are at 
40% gross margin, and all of a sudden your SGNA starts creeping up to 40%, now you're at 0% profit. Right. And so understanding how much you're spending in each of these buckets really helps you understand how much you get to put in your pocket versus how much you get to scale and grow. Yeah, John, when you first explained this to me at our board meeting earlier last year, that was super eye-opening to me to see, just to know how to look at our firm in a much more simple way as we yep. allocated our expenses. So with respect to the research and development, you're talking about differentiation and that to me blends in a little bit with marketing because uh, yep. there's some branding and how you present yourself and tell your story in the marketplace. How do you think about sales and marketing being at 8% R&D with, with that blending? Do you blend those two numbers together? No, I keep them separate. You know, so generally when I think of like the 5% that goes to R&D, I think about when you're in a sales pitch, because I don't think of it as your brand. I think of it as more like the DNA of your business. So do you want to invest in a platform where people can upload documents more easily? Do you want to invest in the first, the onboarding experience and what that onboarding experience is like? Do you want to Got invest it. in something that allows you to do research at a faster rate than anybody else can? And and so I don't know enough about like what one could differentiate, you know, versus another. You know, but I'll just give you an example at Rise. There are 120,000 marketing agencies in the United States and wow. tons and tons of digital marketing companies. What we focused on was being the best at leveraging media data. And we built a technology platform where we could identify waste. So media that you're spending that is just not getting you any return whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like if you're trying to you know, win customers in Chicago and you have billboards in California, it's not going to be very useful. Yeah. And so it helps you identify where your waste is. And then it helps you identify areas that are actually getting you a positive return that you can invest in and scale. Yeah. And so we build a technology platform specifically for that. No one else has it. It gives us a unique edge when we're in a pitch. Yeah. I want your audience who's listening to us to think about what are the things that can make you unique in a pitch that will mean something to the consumer that is purchasing your legal services that gives you an edge. And that's what I want the R&D. The marketing's job is then to get that message out to the world and let people know that you actually have that. Yeah, okay, got it, it makes sense. So with respect to the four leaders of a professional service firm, I heard you say sales and marketing, ops and finance. So a lot of times those are quite different, the ops guy and, and the CFO lady that's running the firm or running the finances of it. So you put those together. If so this is where I was saying that sometimes you want to separate it out. So I have found that a really good salesperson isn't oftentimes a really good marketer. So you might have a head of sales and a head of marketing, right? You might have a head of operations and a head of finance, but over time you might say, you know what? I now have a leader that can manage both of those. Okay. And so. I look at your leadership team should be between four to six people, depending on, you know, do you have someone that is capable of managing sales and marketing or is capable of managing operations and finance, or do they need right. to be split? I got it. Okay. If they are split, John, what's your best recommendation on that 15% being how much goes toward finance, how much goes toward ops? If you know, up? it's a great question. That's actually the next thing I'm starting to benchmark okay. is operations is hr general administrative fees corporate it and legal mm -hmm. and your finance is accounting financial planning and analysis which is budgeting and like business intelligence uh and your taxes uh i do not have great benchmark numbers yet between those okay. two buckets but what i will tell you is it's really important for you to build infrastructure into these areas that uh, build a foundation for you to scale and grow. Mm -hmm. And what I want people to think about is if 15% is the benchmark, can we get you to 12%? And if I can get you to 12%, that means I could go invest more in R&D or more in sales and marketing, which are growth drivers of the business. Right. And so same thing with your gross margin. If I can get you from 50% to 60%, now I get 10 more percentage points to play with that I can either put in profit or put in sales and marketing. And so I wish I could give you a better answer to that, but I do want you to understand the goal is without removing infrastructure is to continually reduce that as a percent of revenue 
but you want to increase R&D and you want to increase sales and marketing as a percent of revenue to scale right. and grow. Yeah. In our world, in the family law world, sales and marketing, most of the sales are done by the lawyers in their client consults. And there's really not, a, we don't look at that as a separate cost because we're not, we don't typically employ salespeople. Our firm does, but we're an exception to that. But most of my colleagues don't. So there really is marketing dollars there. And within those marketing dollars, John, do you have any benchmark advice around how much should be spent on a direct to consumer or a direct response type strategy versus a branding billboard, radio, TV sort of thing? Do you have any thoughts there? I do. Is going to be a little bit of a nebulous answer, kind of like my last answer. But what I'll tell you is direct response with outbuilding brand is really hard. Mm -hmm. And that you need to continually invest in thought leadership and have a point of view and make sure that you're communicating that point of view. Because most of the time when you are getting a customer, it is not because of your direct outreach. Most of the time it is someone has decided they are ready to purchase and they're either going to ask a friend or three to four names are going to come to their mind. And so the more you build your brand, the greater you have of when that moment happens that you made the short list. I'll just give you a real good example and I could do it in any different category, but you know, I'll just say like, if I want to go to get coffee, really the only place I think about right now is Starbucks. There's yeah. another place that's a little bit further away from me, but you know, for the Starbucks kind of owns me in that category. Okay. If I, if I go to a steak restaurant, I already know what I'm going to order before I even go into the restaurant. And if I'm going to go hire a lawyer, I'm most likely going to think about have I worked with someone in the past or what's the brand that goes into who you're going to go after in that specific area? Right. So this is a hypothetical question here. So if you're managing to get your gross margin to 50% and you're still not making the 20%, maybe even 10% net revenue profit take home, where do you typically go on a rye? What category or categories do you see are the ones that are the most bloated or the largest that shouldn't be? That's the cool thing about just having them into these, you know, specific categories. Like you can find out, are you at 15% or at 22% for operations and finance? Are you at 8% or are you at 20% for your sales and marketing? Are you at 7% or are you at 15%? So what I'll typically say is that if you're smaller, 7% for your executive team becomes really challenging because you got to pay yourself and you need to make money and you're in this to make a certain amount of money. Yeah. And so oftentimes the executive team needs more money than that 7% allowed. If you're above 8%, which I want you to be, but you can only go so high unless your gross margin improves, you decide for less profits or you can improve your operations and finance and executive team efficiencies. Mm -hmm. But it might be that your acquisition cost is too high and that you got to really focus on how are you acquiring customers and what do you need to do to lower that cost to acquire a customer? Yeah. Well, that's what you've really challenged us on because our sales and marketing dollars are much higher than 8% of our revenue. And so you've, you've really kind of drilled into us and pressured us in that way in a really healthy way. So thank you for that. Absolutely. You know? Because we're, we're, like you said, we're, we're big time over indexed on direct response versus branding. And that's something yeah. we're looking to change. And look, I have a whole presentation that I do on like how to acquire more leads. Mm -hmm. And what I tell people, and most people don't love the presentation because they're kind of looking for that like light switch opportunity where it's like you spend money here and all of a sudden the floodgates open. And yeah. my experience is that you need to combine direct marketing and direct sales with thought leadership right. and that it is a ramp, you know, that as your thought leadership goes up and you're doing things just like what you're doing now with the podcast and you're building your brand in terms of you have a point of view and people are thinking of you when they run into this issue, that's when you have a, a greater response rate to your direct response. And I'll give you a really good example. I have wealth managers call me all the time asking me to try them out. And that's been going on for you know decades. And when I started Rise and I was a tiny little company, I'm still having all these wealth managers call on me. And then all of a sudden the Goldman Sachs Wealth Management Group called on me. And I was like, why the heck is Goldman Sachs calling me as? I got a tiny little company. There was no reason, it made no sense. But I took the call 
And the reason why I took the call is because it was Goldman Sachs. And I was curious to understand what the case was. And their comment was, we meet with entrepreneurs when they're small and it might take 10 years, but every once in a while, one of them make it. And we, by building a relationship at an early stage, we're there for when the exit happens. Yeah. And, but it's just a really good example of the power of when you build a brand, your direct sales outreach becomes easier. Yeah. So you mentioned a, an interesting term earlier that I want to dig into a little bit, because I think there's some real value here. You talked about a fractional CFO. So what yep. is that and how can you explain how your business does that for firms like family law firms, like I interact with? Yeah. So. I believe that it is imperative for organizations that really want to grow and scale to invest in having a strong financial infrastructure, but you can't necessarily afford to do all of that in-house and have top talent and, and even have all the resources, templates and playbooks. And so there are a whole bunch of companies that specialize in being your outsourced finance department that will close the books for you, they'll pay your bills for you, they'll collect your cash for you on the accounting side. Then there's another group which I, I talked about, which is the financial planning and analysis, which is they'll help you put your budgets together. They'll give you monthly insights into how your business is doing. And ultimately, a really strong outsourced finance department or fractional CFO is good to give you the insights to make better decisions. Mm -hmm. The only other thing that I didn't talk about that I think is a really important benchmark is growing your cash. You mm -hmm. talked about, you know, a lot of owners will take distributions, whether through salary or distributions and put in their pocket. And when you build your cash, you get to do really cool strategic things. And you can start thinking about how do you scale your business through M and A as opposed to just growing organically. And I'm going to give you a really good example. And I'm going to pick probably the most polarizing figure in the <laughs> US today, which is Elon Musk. Elon Musk bought Twitter for $44 billion. And there's a lot of people who are cheering for him. And there's a lot of people cheering against him. And in my version of this or vision, what he really bought was a $44 billion toy for himself. And he is the richest man in the world. And if he loses Twitter, he will go from the richest man in the world to the richest man in the world. He has more than $44 billion between the second richest man and himself. Wow. And so it really, other than ego bruising, it really wouldn't make a big impact to his life. So when you have that much cash, you're buying toys in the tens of billions of dollars. Now, I don't want your listeners to buy toys. I want them to buy strategically well thought out businesses that either expand their service offerings or expand them to new markets. By building your cash, you get to do really cool strategic things. Yeah, your company, Fiscal Advocate, that's the company that does the fractional CFO work? Yep. Okay, is there a size when a law firm would start to become a good candidate or kind of eligible then to have the extra cash to start investing in a fractional CFO? Probably around a million or $2 million a month. It's about five to $10,000 a month in terms of an investment in your finance department when you start using a fractional CFO company, which I don't know if that sounds like a lot of money or not a lot of money, but you know, if you think about hiring an entry level person out of college today, probably 60 to $70,000 full time. And yeah. so you're basically equating a full time entry level person, maybe up to a mid level person, but getting an entire finance department. Mm -hmm. So what would be the revenue on a yearly basis for a, a firm when to get to the right kind of size to start investing in that you think? I would say about a million in okay. revenue. I would say maybe, maybe 750,000. You also like it's a la carte. There's different elements that you can do. What I'd also say is I think part of it is also mindset. Are you looking to stay a small law firm or are you looking to become a larger law firm? Right. And as I said in the, in the beginning of this episode, there's no wrong answer. But building a really strong financial infrastructure, I think is more important if you want to scale and grow, where I think you get away with just 
solid bookkeeping if you want to kind of stay in a smaller side. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just shifting gears here, John, when did you first know that you have tremendous leadership skills? I don't know if I still do. What I would say is I read extensively and I study business as a sport and want to constantly get better. You can generally tell your leadership skills based on how much people are inspired by you. Do they follow you? Do they stay with your company? Overall, I think I have a really good track record of the people who work with me really enjoy working with me. I also have some very strong beliefs that I think are really important. So I believe in a performance-based culture. If you think about a professional sports team, I want to run a business like a professional sports team. I want the best players within my company. And the smaller you are, the more important that is. You know, you can't afford to have a bad hire. Mm -hmm. I believe in having a long-term view to your business. So I want to build something great. I'm not just looking to flip this to make money. Uh, yeah. I care more about the customers and do I drive an outcome for them? And I think those things are, you know, inspiring to people to work at a place where A players get to work with A players, that you're looking to build something long and special, that you're customer centric, that you care more about, do we help improve the finances of our customers versus are we going to sell for a big number one day? You know, I have eight specific things that I generally look at in terms of what's a formula for successful business. Yeah, I know this is putting you on the spot. Do you know what those eight things are? Can you off the top of your head? If you give me two seconds, I can read them to you. So okay. just for the record, I see you pull it out of your pocket. So is that in your wallet? <laughs> it's in a, it's okay. in my phone here. Okay. So the first one I talked to was performance-based culture. The second one is the pursuit of world-class. So the idea behind this is that I don't care who your target audience is. I don't care if you're going after high end, you know, high net wealth individuals, low income individuals. I believe that you have to constantly think about how you make your product and service better. And that what you offer is a world-class product. Mm -hmm. Third one is balanced intensity. I've been studying a lot. And like, if you look at like Elon Musk and his whole like hardcore culture, you look at Jeff Bezos, you look at Bill Gates, you look at Steve Jobs, they had extremely demanding culture where they want their employees working nonstop around the clock. Uh, what I want is what I call is balanced intensity. When you work, I want you working really hard, but I don't want you working on weekends. I don't want you working till midnight every night. I want you to spend time with your family. And so I believe balanced intensity is really important that every moment that you're working really matters and that you're getting the most you can within that time period. The next one is a data-centric decision-making. This whole episode's really been about data-centric decision-making. Yeah. How do you have the benchmark numbers to make really good decisions? Every decision you make is a leap of faith. The more you can have data, the more you can reduce that leap so that you make a smarter decision in terms of how you spend your time and money. Yeah. I talked about building a, a great business and focusing on the long term, not looking to flip it. Customer centric, it is absolutely crucial. And that's the other thing. Like if you look at Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, they all were incredibly focused on being customer centric. The next one is continuously simplify. So how do you do less things better as opposed to trying to do a million different things? And how do you take steps out of processes? How do you take features away that are unnecessary? So the more you can simplify your business, I believe the better you will be. And then the last one is, I believe in investing in growth. I think it is awesome for the people who want something small. That is great. They know who they are, what they want to be, just not part of my DNA. Like I want to build something great. And so I am constantly investing in sales and marketing and R and D to invest in growth. And so those are my eight different things. Those are awesome principles. So John, uh, how could we get a hold of you? So my email is jon at enginebi.net. I post almost every day on LinkedIn, so follow me on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And you can also go to enginebi.net or fiscaladvocate.com to learn more about our services. Awesome, thank you. You have a great newsletter on LinkedIn as well, so. Excellent, thank you. So. Well, thank you, John, for coming on the show today and sharing this with us. It's been terrific in our firm. And I hope it's adding value to those that are listening in their firm. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me on today.